Good morning. How are you guys doing today? So I lived for a big part of my life in South America, and we start everything late. So we're just, we're just hanging on to that truth and starting a little bit late this morning. Hope you guys are okay with that. So it's, it's good to be with you this morning. This has been a busy week at the church, lots of stuff going on. And we want to praise and worship the Lord this morning and give him all the glory. And we're going to sing just that, to God be the glory. If you guys are okay, please stand up with us. And let's sing this kind of odd hymn with a bit of a twist on it.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Well and BIC Church this morning. Either if you're here in person or online, we're so happy that you're here. Uh, if you're a new person here uh, today, we're so happy that you've joined us to ch- check out our church, little church community. Um, we love having new people. Uh, I just encourage you to, if you are new, uh, to reach out to me or Pastor Andrew right over here. He'll wave. Um, or Pastor Larry, wherever he is. There he is. Um, we love to connect with you and uh, get to know you. Uh, so uh, I know we're a little bit, might be a little bit scary, but <laughs> we'll try to be friendly. <laughs> um, so I just have a few announcements for us. Uh, first off, uh, social distancing. I know we're in a community where we really love each other and we want to hug each other and stuff. I just encourage you to still keep that distance at six feet apart or so, um, just to keep everyone safe. Um, also, I encourage you to silence, silence your phones. Uh, we don't want to be like in the middle of a prayer and then all of a sudden it's like, dar, 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 dar. Um, it's a little bit distracting. Uh, so if even if you think it's turned off, I encourage you to just double check. Um, also, uh, during the week, we have a prayer time with Pastor Larry. Uh, if you want to get involved with that, uh, I encourage you to talk to him and he'll give you all the information for that. Um, again, he's right over there. Um, and for Compass Kids, for August, we try to give our Compass Kids leaders a bit of a month off because they're amazing and they put so much effort into kids. Uh, but we do have booklets in the back. If you haven't grabbed one and you're a Compass Kid, make sure to grab one. They're on the table back there. And I just want to remind you, too, to give them back after the service if you do have one. Um, Finally, we have a few new technical things. So we're having a little bit of technical difficulties today. So if if we do, just be patient. Uh, We'll hopefully figure it out. (laughs) Uh, Finally, um, coming into church today, you might be like, wow, they they have some interesting decorations. Um, We have a little smoke machine in the back. Um, some DNA, and um, we also have some food right here. Um, so this week we had our VBS program, which was amazing. Uh, we had a lot of fun, and part of that, we actually collected uh, some canned goods and stuff. As you can see right here, all the kids and uh, some of their parents, um, these are the parents actually were able to join in uh, on Friday. Uh, we'll be able to bring all of this, these canned goods for Open Arms Mission. Let's just give them a hand of applause. Um, and while you're clapping, let's clap again for our volunteers because like, they did an amazing job. Um, the numbers, I think roughly, were we had about 13 kids from our own church, and then we had 50 in total. So we had a good chunk of... Um, kids who didn't go to our church, which is amazing, and a great outreach. Um, and finally, we actually have a video to show you kind of what it was like here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse, so we're going to show that right now. Hope you enjoy it.
Good morning. As you can see, there was a lot of energy this past week in terms of the Vacation Bible School. We're going to pray for those children and uh, parents that were here on Friday night. Just a couple of things as we uh, begin this prayer time this morning. I'd like you to join with me in prayer for Mary Spano. Uh, Mary had a kind of a rough day yesterday. We want to pray for her. Uh, Noreen Brown, we're glad to see you here this morning, and we're going to continue to pray for Noreen. Uh, Tilda is here, and as you know, yesterday was a service of remembrance for Len, and we want to pray for uh, Tilda today, and would you join me with that? We're going to intercede this morning in terms of Afghanistan. There's a lot happening there, a lot of pain, and we want to pray about that. And speaking of prayer, uh, when it says there, call Pastor Larry, really, uh, Sharon is the uh, key person there for our Tuesday night prayer time and Thursday. I, uh, I've, of course, agreed to that because we are a team in prayer. And so if you have something on your heart that you'd like us to pray about, uh, be sure and call us and we'll be glad to pray with you. So let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for this wonderful privilege today of uh, being here in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for this summer season. Yes, we could complain about the heat, but this is the kind of day that in, uh, in March or in December, we'll look back and say that was a good day. So here we are today to worship you and thank you for this great spot to worship in this building today where the cool air is blowing over us and we're relaxed in the presence of Jesus. I trust that to be the case today for each and every one of us. So, Father, we come to you with thanksgiving. It's been a very busy week. I pray especially for all of those who gave leadership to the VBS. Uh, some of these people are um, worn down. It's been a lot of heavy work before and during the event, and it's been a great week. Thank you for the emphasis on prayer, the emphasis on God's word. Thank you, Lord, for what you were saying to the boys and girls and to parents. And so we intercede while the event is over. It's not over because your spirit has spoken and will continue to speak because that's who you are. And so we pray for every one of those boys and girls that attended and the parents the other night. We pray that your spirit will touch their hearts and draw them closer to you. Father, we intercede this morning for Mary Spano. We pray your grace upon her, that you would uh, uh, straighten out this issue, this dizziness, whatever is happening to her, and we pray that uh, she would sense your presence today, even at home. Thank you, Lord, for your touch on Noreen Brown, and we pray your continued blessing upon her today. Strengthen her, and in the midst of life's uh, stresses and challenges at time, thank you for your all-sufficient grace. Father, we thank you for helping Pastor Gord yesterday in that service in Donville. We pray your grace upon Tilda today and all the family. We pray that you would accomplish your plan and purpose even in the midst of loss, grief, and pain. Father, I want to intercede for another dear friend of mine who's lost her brother-in-law, and I pray for the striker home today that you will visit them with your great and awesome power. Father, our hearts are burdened and heavy over what's happening in Afghanistan. We can't even imagine the turmoil of which these people who are trying to escape for missionaries, for um, leaders, uh, people who are in office, who are just uh, tired of all the uproar and upheaval in that country. And yet, Father, we understand it's the second largest country in the world that is receiving the gospel of Christ and responding to that. Thank you that you said in your word in Matthew 16, 18, that you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So, Father, we pray that your kingdom would come today in the midst of this pain and all of this grief and all this, well, I was going to say hell, and that's really what it is. It isn't from you, this bondage, this war, this uh, uh, issue, Lord, of killing and uh, just doing all kinds of wicked things. Father, we intercede for that nation today and pray for these people whose hearts are riveted by the powers of darkness. We pray for light today to penetrate their hearts. That's not too big of an issue for you. You know how to do that. And Father, we intercede for them today. Father, we pray for Taiwan and the issue there regarding them and China. We know, Lord, there's a potential, a real upheaval there. 
There's a lot of tension in our world, Father. You are the answer to that. So we pray your grace upon these things. Father, I want to pray your special blessing on Pastor Andrew as he comes here in a while to preach the message you've laid on his heart from the book of John. I pray that you'll anoint him, that you'll strengthen him. I pray your blessing on he and his wife as they uh, truck off tomorrow for down east. I pray that you'll give them a great time of relaxation and enjoyment. Help them to be able to leave all behind that uh, would uh, trouble him perhaps about here and uh, the weight of his responsibilities. Help him to rest. That's what it's all about, resting and relaxation. Help him to rest and Charmaine as well. And Father, we pray for their children today. We pray that your grace would be upon them as they continue to stay home and do work. And I pray that uh, you would just help them. Thank you for others who will be there to help them and to be a blessing to them. So, Father, we pray your blessing on all these things upon the unspoken requests for prayer today. There are people in this audience who need a touch from God, and we pray that more than a touch today as they walk out of this building, even before they get home, that they will have been in the very presence of God, and that's where we are today. For where you are, where your presence is, where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. So we give you praise and thanks for this opportunity to pray and intercede and to bless. And so, Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory. That's what we're going to look at next Sunday, the glory of Jesus as his prayer in John 17. So, Father, I pray that we'll be used to that. We'll get to know more about the glory of God as we sang about it this morning. Great things you have done, great things you are doing, and you'll continue to do because you are God. We worship you and give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. My guitar is falling apart here. Kind of like me. <laughs> but that's okay. <clears throat> Still seems to be working. So I don't think I've been up here doing worship since uh, I think sometime around Christmas when we hit whatever wave that was. Mike was joking around saying, we've hit so many waves he feels like he's going to become a surfer. <laughs> so... <laughs> Our lives have been through so much change, and, and Telly, we're, we're praying for you and your family and the change that you guys are just going through recently. And <clears throat> looking at some of the images from Af Afghanistan, it's been unbelievable, and I can't imagine the change that um, those folks are going through. So this song, I just felt that the Lord was leading me to, to include it in our worship service this morning. It's called The Goodness of God. We sang it a few times before, but it just talks about um, <clears throat> the Lord being faithful to us no matter what's going through. And sometimes you feel like the Lord's not there when you're going through some difficult stuff. But I encourage you to look back at your life and, and, and look back at the history and how he might have been with you, or he definitely was with you during some of those difficult times. So if you're able to, please stand as we sing this song, The Goodness of God. Come on. 
you up today for your mercy and your grace upon us to protect us, to guide us, to lead us through all our struggles in our lives, Father, and that we see the good and the bad in everything, that there's a lot of good that comes out of this, and that we have complete faith in you. In your precious name, we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you for your worship this morning. Please be seated. Thank you, worship team. Well, for those of you who may not know me or might be watching online for the first time, my name is Andrew. I have the incredible privilege of being one of the staff members at Well and BIC, one of the pastors on staff, and uh, I absolutely love our church. I am looking forward to leaving tomorrow morning to go to New Brunswick for two weeks. Uh, but I will also be looking forward to watching online and coming back in two weeks as I love our church. Well, if you've been tracking with us at all as a church, we're in a series called Jesus in the book of John, Jesus in the book of John. And today we're taking on and looking at probably a subject that probably shouldn't be approximately a 20-minute message. It should probably be about a 20-hour message and take maybe about 20 weeks or so to unpack it. Miracles are controversial, especially in evangelical circles, because, to be honest, they're misinterpreted, and they're, I wouldn't say they're misused, but they're misguided at times, and there's different opinions, and we have many 
so-called TV evangelists who make very good money off of miracles and, and this type of realm of things. Now, just to put a disclaimer out there, I'm going to challenge some things in those challenges of how we think about miracles and how we interpret miracles and so forth does not mean, and please hear me clearly, you online and you here, I believe in miracles. I most certainly do. However, I think that we have done a disservice at times and we have given inappropriate attention to miracles at different times within the evangelical circle. And I'm going to try and unpack that a little bit. One of the things I'm going to say that you may be uncomfortable with is in regards to Scripture itself, our Holy Bible. Now, I believe this to be the living Word of God. I believe it to be transformative. I believe it to be our guideline for life. I believe it to be our love letter from God. However, I also believe in 2021 that we misunderstand a lot of the cultural perspective within Scripture. I think there are some times that we think, oh yeah, that's so for today, when it actually wasn't. And it was meant for a cultural perspective. And I'm going to unpack that just so you don't think I'm too uh, crazy or too heretical or anything like that and want to take me out back and leave me there or anything like that. But I'm going to try and do my best in a, in a slow or in a short amount of time to unpack that a bit. Miracles is a huge subject. It really is. And it's a wonderful subject. As I said, I, I believe in miracles. I have been a part of praying for people in the past where I truly believe a miracle happened. So maybe we should unpack miracle, just the word a little bit, so that we all kind of are on the same page to begin with. So I believe a miracle to be something absolutely supernatural that a human on their own will or own power or whatever you want to call it would never be able to accomplish on their own. Okay, so a miracle is supernatural. I believe that there are certainly, you could argue how many types of miracles are, but primarily, I believe there are two types of miracles. I believe there is a miracle of physical healing, and I believe that there is a miracle of spiritual healing in the sense of what we read in Scripture with the idea of demons being cast out of people. That is miraculous. That is not something we can do on our own power. That is, comes from the power that lives within us, the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of Jesus Christ. So I look at those as being primarily two types of miracles, a miracle of healing, physical healing, and a miracle of what I call spiritual healing. Now, one of the reasons I say this idea is that we misinterpret culture and so forth because a couple things are happening. In Jesus' day, there were actually, and I don't know if you knew this or not, there were actually several miracle workers. Jesus was not the only one who was able to perform miracles. In fact, he gives over power to his disciples to be able to perform miracles, and we'll see some stories about that in a few moments. We at one point actually see the disciples, they're sent out to do miracles. And they come back and they say, Jesus, we, we were unsuccessful in this. And Jesus says, well, that's because the miracles you were looking for to happen today, they need to come by prayer and fasting, not just by prayer. So there's some guidelines there that Jesus puts in place. Now, that being said, we can run a slippery slope of misinterpreting a view of Scripture. For example, I want to turn to John chapter, we're in the book of John, and I'm going to be floating around throughout the book of John to look at different miracles. But first of all, we're going to start in John chapter 20, verse 26 to 31. And it says this, it says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Then it goes on to say, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. 
And then this incredible verse, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, that by believing you may have life in his name. See, Jesus' miracles were done in such a way to bring attention to himself, to, valid, to uh, validate his ministry. Now, like I said, there were other cultural people in that day. There were other people who performed miracles. Now, they weren't in the name of Jesus, so they perhaps were done through magic, black magic type stuff, sorcery, or witchcraft. But there were people who could still perform miracles other than Jesus. Now, what's interesting about Jesus' miracles is we see one specific miracle in Jesus that happened here. Well, I can't point to it today. That happened on the cross. And that really defines Jesus' ministry and Jesus' miracles from any others. That Jesus was to rise from the grave and he lived again. And we'll look at that a little bit later as well. So there is certainly some controversy around the subject of miracles. And it's a tough subject to unpack. Miracles and or the hope for miracles can lead to judgments and legalism. I think that's on our next slide, Rebecca, if I recall. So there's a warning that comes along, or at least I would like to suggest there should be a warning that comes along with miracles. There is the potential of judgment and legalism. Remember in the book of John, and we talked about this a few weeks ago when we were in our series with Job about Job's friends believed that he had sinned. He must have done something wrong to deserve his fate. And the evangelical circle, unfortunately, has kind of played into this at different times. We've prayed for people for miracles, and they haven't been healed, and, and a judgment comes in our mind, or legalism comes to our mind, and we think, oh, they must not have done something right to have been healed. Or worse, sometimes we think, I must not have prayed correctly. And so there's a danger here. There's a warning sign in terms of miracles. Yes, we as evangelical Christ followers should believe in miracles, but we need to be careful in how we approach and how we pray for miracles. It brings about possible confusion, frustration, and hurt going along with that prayer. Many of us have prayed for loved ones, and we've seen other people healed over here of physical ailments, for instance, cancer being one of them. But we pray the same way for this person over here, and this person doesn't get healed. Does that mean that God's not a miracle worker? Absolutely not. But the warning for us is to be careful with that, because we, we just from our human perspective, we don't understand it, and we can become judgmental, we can become critical. And we certainly can become confused and frustrated and hurt. And that certainly isn't God's intention and or purpose through us by granting this person over here a miracle and not granting this person a miracle. If I can go on just a, a small bunny trail for a second, and my wife's already cringing, and I already forgot the bunny trail, so maybe she was praying for me. <laughs> it's probably true. Yeah, someone claps. Thank goodness Pastor Andrew's not going on a bunny trail. A proper teaching of miracles allows us to understand that miracles are in God's hands. See, some, the scripture is clear that some of us actually will have a gift of healing or have a gift of miracles that is meant for the body of Christ, that is meant to edify the body of Christ and meant to glorify Jesus Christ himself. But what happens is, unfortunately, some of these people who have these gifts and or imitate these gifts have left a bad taste in certain people's mouths because their ministry is actually false. And it's not true to who God wants them to be and how he wants them to use their gifts. So a proper teaching of miracles allows us to understand that miracles are in God's hands to decide and determine who and when a person receives them. Now speaking of miracles, there are approximately 14 miracles in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, that Jesus is a part of, approximately 22 in the Gospel of Mark, which is very interesting. Mark is our, our smallest gospel in terms of chapters, 
Luke, but records the most miracles, and approximately 17 miracles in the Gospel of John. Now, there's a lot of biblical scholars, and I never really understood this, but they are on a real kick about there being seven miracles and using the number seven of perfection for the Gospel of John. When I read through the entire Gospel of John this week in preparation for this, I record nine miracles. So I'm not as smart as these other Bible scholars, but I I certainly have nine, and I'm going to show you what I believe the nine are. So first, we have the turning of water into wine in Cana. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Remember this miracle? Oh, this is a controversial miracle in itself because those of us who are like juice fanatics in the evangelical circles, we don't really believe this miracle because Jesus would never make wine for people at a wedding to party. That's just wrong. Not enough of you are laughing along with my sarcasm here. (laughs) But I believe he did. I believe it was one of the things that allowed Jesus to enter into the culture and to say, you know what, I'm, I'm human, I'm here, I'm here to bless you. It was a cultural thing. It was a cultural thing to have wine at these weddings, and not just a little bit of wine, a lot of wine. And if you look at, I, one thing I want to encourage you, if you don't have a study Bible, I really encourage you to spend the 50-ish dollars. You can go on christianbooks.com, order one off of there. They're usually good priced. Get a study Bible that has notes in the sides and tells you different things about cultural context and so forth because it's really helpful. Because I grew up thinking that the wine that Jesus made, the six jars, were about this big. I don't know if you know or not, but they're about like this big in diameter. And they're probably about this tall. And the scripture says that he fills six of them. And the scripture also says it's not just the the kind of regular wine that they give later on as people are getting drunk. It says it's the best wine. In fact, the people who had tasted it had never tasted anything as good. Now, that's not to be unexpected with a miracle from Jesus. We have the healing of the official son in Capernaum in chapter uh, John chapter 4, verses 46 to 54. We have a healing of a par- paralytic at the pool of Bethsaida. Now, this is really interesting. The pool of Bethsaida was considered to be a pool where an actual angel, this is kind of folk legend, so it's not, it's not in your scripture, you won't find it in your scripture, but other historical books refer to it, where an angel would come down and they would stir the pool. And so when you, when you read in that miracle, you'll actually read that part in John chapter 5, you'll read that the paralytic is waiting there for someone to come along and stir the pool. And he says to Jesus, no one has stirred the pool yet. And Jesus says, <laughs> never mind that stirring thing, that's, that's probably folk legend. Take up your mat and walk. That paralytic doesn't even have to get into the water to be healed by Jesus. Incredible miracle. Feeding the 5,000 near the Sea of Galilee, John chapter 6, walking on the water. Woo, what an awesome miracle that is. Remember, and I'm not sure if it's the one in John, but because it, it's recorded in multiple gospels, but Peter, the brave one, walks out and then he starts to sink. And we often think, I, I, I love a, an illustration that I heard years and years ago, and it was from a teacher who's very controversial in today's day and age, but I think the principle applied. He said that we often think that um, Peter lost faith in Jesus, but it was very possible that Peter lost faith in himself to continue to walk on the water. We see the healing of a blind man in in Jerusalem in John chapter 9 at the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam was recently, I forget how many years ago it was, but it was uncovered as an archaeological place and just gives some proof to our scripture that that was actually there and that was a, uh, that was a, a wild miracle. That's the one where Jesus spits into the mud, rubs it in his hands and puts it on the gentleman's eyes and then tells him to go and wash. Now what's really interesting is the pool of Siloam wasn't meant for that type of washing. To have brought mud into that pool was a really bad thing to do. But Jesus didn't care. I think he was trying to make a point, again, about cleansliness and how people viewed that in his day and his culture. We have the raising of his friend Lazarus. Remember that miracle where we get our shortest verse in Scripture. It says, Jesus wept. 
yet Jesus brings Lazarus back to life. We have the resurrection of Jesus himself, John chapter 20. And then we have the catching of the fish, John 21. So Jesus has come back from the dead. He's walking along the beach, and Peter's out fishing again, and they're having no luck with the fish again. And Jesus yells out and does what he did when he called them his disciples. says, hey, I think you should throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And they don't quite clue in yet. And then it says, all of a sudden, the fish come And it gives us a really weird description in John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. It says this, the miraculous catch of 153 fish. What a weird comment in Scripture. 153 fish. What? Now, are you a numbers person? And I want to be careful again. This can get controversial. So don't get caught up in biblical numbers too much. But there are some things that we can learn. We, we do believe that this number seven represents a perfection type number in Scripture. But this was interesting. This was an article I found. So Jerome, a Christian priest, theologian, and historian who lived from 347 to 420 AD, so not that long after this miracle in terms of our, our humanity and our history, recorded that Greek zoologists believe there to be 153 different species of fish at that time. I thought that was kind of cool. It was believed that there were 153 known nations at the time that Jesus made this miracle. The word Yahweh is called a tetragrammaton, and in the Jewish tradition is used in place of writing God in the Bible. Apparently, Yahweh is used 153 times in the book of Genesis. Interesting. Gematria is an alphanumeric code where letters in the Greek and Hebrew alphabets have been given numeric value. In English, we might say it like this. A is worth one point, B is worth two points, C is worth three, and so forth. So in the Greek and Hebrew alphabet, they have a numeric system for their letters. The number 153 is the numerical total for the Hebrew phrase, any Elohim, which means I am God. Isn't that cool? Now again, I'm not putting like a lot of weight into this, and I love that what this guy says at the end of the article. He says this. He says, of course, it could just be that the fishermen pulled such a large catch and they just wanted to know how many fish were in the net. Could be. But there's a lot of really interesting connections to the number 153. So, Matthew, I'm going to go off course just a little bit. Matthew 26 and 2 Corinthians chapter 12 give us two examples of two incredibly important people in Scripture who pray for miracles at different times and don't receive them. See, we trust, we have faith, we have hope in miracles, and we should do that, and we should pray for those. But sometimes God just says, no, you're not getting the miracle. Sometimes we pray for a healing miracle, and then someone passes away, and we said, well, there it is, God did the miracle. That's not true. That's just messing with the concept. That's just messing with words. We didn't pray for that person to be healed in a way where they would be taken away by God. We were praying for this person to be physically healed here on earth so we could spend more time with them. God taking them out of their pain is is an element of his grace, but it's not a miracle. So we see two characters in Scripture. The first we see is Jesus himself, Jesus himself. Sometimes God answers our specific request in saying no. However, the grace he provides us is always sufficient. Remember Jesus in a very specific position, most likely on his knees praying to God in a garden called Gethsemane. And three times he goes back to that garden to pray, and three times he asks God, God, if it would be your will, please take this cup of suffering from me. In other words, he was saying in his humanness, God, I don't, want to go, I don't want to go through with this. I'm terrified. He was sweating blood. 
from the agony, from the anxiety of what he was about to go through. But at the end of those prayers, he says this, God, not my will, but yours. Paul is considered to have this thorn in his flesh, and biblical scholars and experts have had field days in writing what they all think this is about, and no one has any clue, really, other than Paul and God. But there was something that was bothering Paul, something that he repeatedly asked God to take away, and God just wouldn't do it. God said no. Unfortunately, God says no sometimes to our miracles or the miracles that we're asking for. But that doesn't change the fact that God does indeed perform miracles. So in all of this, sometimes God says no. He says no to the repeated requests of Jesus and Paul. He faithfully provided exactly what they needed. And that was this. See, when God doesn't perform a miracle, he doesn't just abandon us. He didn't abandon Jesus. Now, you may say, well, when he got on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a, that's a whole different picture of stuff. But when God doesn't answer our prayer for the miracle of a loved one who might have cancer or something else going on in them, whatever it might be, heart condition, he hasn't abandoned us in that situation. And this is where a more appropriate uh, application or interpretation of Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 comes in. You guys know this verse, uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, uh, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Right? We, we love to jump around and, woo, I can do all things. I can pick up this snake because I can do all things. That was weird, right? That was like way too southern cultish like or something weird. But we misclaim and misinterpret at times Philippians 4.13. Sometimes we do the, the blab it and grab it thing or the name it and claim it thing. And that's okay to a certain degree as long as we understand that that may not be God's will. So we trust and we believe, and so what should we do? I think I have a last slide here. Or maybe I have a middle slide. So, oh, I was going to uh, use this also as an example. Miracles there. Oh, that screen was different than that for a split second, right? I think that was weird. Oh, go back, though, for me, Rebecca, please. Miracles. So there are times when God intervenes to alter a course of events. So that's like the physical type of miracle. And then there are times when he interfuses. I just wanted two words that started with inner. When he interfuses, when he comes alongside of us, when he partners with us. So he hasn't allowed the miracle to happen, or he hasn't made the miracle happen, but he said, you know what, I'm not going to leave you, I'm not going to forsake you in this moment, I will still be with you during this painful and trying moment. So what should we do? So next slide, just to close today. I think we have it here. Okay, so what now? So what should we do? We should continue to pray. Just because certain miracles haven't been answered in our lifetime or certain things that we've prayed about haven't come to fruition in terms of a miracle doesn't mean we should just stop praying and or believing in miracles. They most certainly happen. God most certainly is a miraculous God. But we have to keep in mind he chooses the miracle. He chooses when and who will receive them and at what times they will receive with them. So continue to pray, believe, hope, and trust. Rejoice, Romans 12 verse 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Don't make the miracle that happens more than that or less than that. And don't make the miracle that doesn't happen more or less than that. See, when a miracle doesn't happen, we as evangelicals, we love to just start to justify it. And that's where I said the problem with legalism and um, judgmentalism comes into play. Well, there must have been something wrong. We must, 
We must not have prayed for three hours instead of two hours. Like those types of thoughts in regards to miracles are, are ridiculous. That's legalism. Jesus came to change that. He came to show a different way from that legalism. So it's not about how much we do. It's not about what we do. Yes, we want to trust and we want to believe in faith. And there are all kinds of great scriptures that help us lead us into that. But don't make these things more or less than what they are. So when someone receives a miracle, yes, we obviously want to praise the Lord and we want to rejoice with those people. But there are also those who do not receive the miracle in that way. And we simply just want to mourn with those people. We want to sit in that place, but we also want to bring an encouraging word that God gives us a peace in these things that goes beyond our understanding. And that's what I mean by kind of the second miracle, the, the miracle of kind of spiritual healing. It's not a miracle in the sense that we were hoping and praying for and that someone would get healed physically but it brings about a peace to the whole situation that we can sit and go, you know what? God has this situation in his hands no matter what the outcome and his will will be done.